Welcome to our April WAMISA seminar. My name is Lorna Strachan and I'm a member of the WAMISA committee and I'm organising this year's seminar series. WAMISA is an international organisation and we wish to acknowledge Māori as tangata, whenua and te tariti o Waitangi partners in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Indigenous peoples were the first Australian and New Zealand earth and environmental scientists. And we have a lot to learn from their deep knowledge that spans tens of thousands of years. The, Wim the Wimisa seminar series is about showcasing the amazing work of women in earth and environmental science in Australasia. All the recordings of past seminars are available on our website. You can sign up as a, a member of WAMISA to get a notification of upcoming seminars, or you can follow us on Twitter. I'm delighted to introduce our April speaker, Dr. Caroline Eakin. Caroline is a senior lecturer in seismology at the Australian National University in the Research School of Earth Sciences and is currently an ARC DECRA fellow. She moved to Australia in 2016 to take up a continuing position at ANU after previously bouncing back and forth across the Atlantic, following a PhD at Yale and a postdoc at Southampton. Her research focuses on observational seismology, deploying arrays of seismometers in geologically interesting places and studying the subsurface structure and dynamics of the Earth's interior. Current projects include seismic deployments around Karitanda, Lake Eyre in central Australia, and new adventures in ocean bottom seismology with a recent seafloor deployment in the Southern Ocean along the Macquarie Ridge. So now it is my pleasure to hand you over to Caroline. Thank you very much, Lorna. And thank you those who are joining on the call today. Um, I'd like to begin by paying my re respects to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land in which I join um, today. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about um, it's going to be a slightly different talk for me. It's going to be a bit about the, the science, my science as a seismologist, uh, particularly recent work investigating mantle deformation beneath Australia. Essentially, we think of the red centre of Australia. Um, essentially, Australia is covered in a blanket of sediments. And, and what, how can we use seismology and geophysics to learn more about deep beneath the surface? I'm also going to wrap this in with a bit more of some personal stories and think about um, a bit of a theme on kind of stereotypes, both in the science and kind of personal um, situation. So I'm going to take the first phrase, um, a seismologist down under, and what that kind of conjures up or a seismologist in Australia. And to me, when I you know, make this talk and I make the title slide and I make these figures, I think of Australia, I think of this huge continent, I think of the outback, I think of doing field work in the outback, um, you know, taking our field work vehicles, driving across um, the country. I had a really fun experience um, a year or two ago in a helicopter in the Simpson Desert and wearing my fly net out in the, in the outback. But to be honest, I probably only do that. That's maybe only one or two weeks a year that I'm actually in the field. What I find most interesting though, is other people's reactions to learning that I'm a seismologist in Australia. And particularly what I find to be an interesting kind of litmus test of society is talking to Uber drivers or taxi drivers. So I don't actually own a car, I can drive, but I personally don't own a car. I live fairly close to work, um, but when there's bad weather, I take my fair share of Ubers um, to get home from work, for example. And you know, you get in an Uber and they always ask, you know, start chatting to you, having a, having a conversation. And there's two questions that they, as soon as they pick me up from work, you're at the Research School of Earth Sciences to find out I'm a seismologist. There's two questions they always ask. First one is you're a seismologist, why are you in Australia? And the second most common question is, are you a student? Are you studying? And I think a lot of people probably um, get this, it got to the point where it was happening so often that there was like a period in a few years back. Um, and I was like, around the time I was kind of turning 30 and I was like, 
I'm definitely not young anymore. And I started recording how many, writing down every time someone asked me this. In a period of a few months, I got asked seven times that I've like noted down in my phone. And it's like, if it's just once or twice, you kind of kind of just brush it off, laugh it off. But when it starts to get, you know, I think this is a really good example of when you start getting this repeatedly and people keep questioning repeatedly what it is that you do and sort of, it starts to sort of make you feel, oh, do I not, you know, do I not belong doing this? Do I, am I not part of this? And it's really interesting that whenever people say it and I explain, oh no, I'm a, you know, I'm a lecturer, I work here. They always say, oh, you should take it as a compliment. Not a single person ever says like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. And it's, you know, maybe you should just laugh it off. When it starts to be re repeated, the repeat over and over, it no longer starts to feel like a compliment. It starts to feel like it's sort of like, sort of diminishing your position a little bit. Um, but that's something that I think just society's sort of like ideas of what it is that a academic or a seismologist is. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time and sort of like unpack some of this a little bit. So I'm gonna start off a bit more on these kind of stereotypes, misconceptions of what it is that a seismologist does or a scientist does. Then I'm gonna talk a bit, so basically the outline of the talk, I'm gonna then move on to what it is that I actually do, describe a bit about my research and my science. And then the last part, the last third of the talk will be a, story, a bit of a story background, how I got to be here, how I got to be a seismologist down under. And this is essentially the longer version of what I would try to describe in the Uber, in the car going home. So first I thought, let's have a look at what is, how do people envision a seismologist? So this is kind of a bit like picture a scientist, but instead of picturing a seismologist, I decided let's Google a seismologist. So I just search for a seismologist. I signed myself out of Google. I turned off anything I could that was like customized your search based on you know previous searches. So it's not showing me what I would see, but trying to see what the average person would see. And then, but it is, you still have to select a country. So it is still focused on Australia. And this is what you get. There's, you know, at least I was, you know, I counted out, it's nice to see there is a kind of mixture of men and women, but it's probably still about two thirds men, one third um, women. There's a lot of, you know, either the pictures are kind of, you're out in the field kind of deploying instruments or you're on a computer looking at seismograms. There's a lot of kind of men pointing at things on the screen. There's a lot of like that going on. That seems to be our sort of like classic idea of what a seismologist does, pointing at us at seismic waves, pointing at waves produced by an earthquake. If I think about what it is that seismologists actually do, um, I think seismology is actually a very broad term. And I think there's a huge diversity in what the word seismologist can actually um, mean. I describe myself as an observational seismologist, but there might be, you know, and that involves a bit of field work mostly looking at data. There might be people who spend a lot more time in the field or developing instrumentation. Thing, people who are more theoretical seismologists, kind of on the sort of fundamental physics, computational seismology, computing a lot of um, uh, programs. And I just tried to like write down a bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna go through it all, but really the idea is there's such a wide range that seismologists actually do. Even from the fundamental, you know, the fundamental idea seismologists study ground motion, how the ground vibrates and the ground moves. But that can be created by many things. So earthquakes are just one thing. Um, you know, there's a whole industry in terms of exploration, um, active source seismology, um, exploring for resources, um, people who study um, explosions, monitoring nuclear test ban treaties, um, mining seismology, people who study mine blasts and safety in mines, induced seismicity from wastewater injection, um, environmental seismology, studying glaciers, how they're um, evolving and flowing, rock falls, anything kind of environmental. Even people just study the noise, the ocean noise and how it couples to the ground and then use that as part of imaging. And then we've got earthquakes. And now we even have 
a seismometer on Mars. So now we even have earthquakes on another planet, we have Mars quakes. So really there's such, I feel there's such a diversity of what seismologists do that's not represented in those images that come up when you Google a seismologist. But perhaps those images are a bit better than if you do the same thing and you Google a geologist. Those images, you're pretty much dominated by rocks. You're in the field, you're out with your hammer, you're sampling rocks. Um, and yes, geologists do that, but it really, you know, I, I'm not, I describe myself as a seismologist, maybe a small part of geology, but I really think geology is a much more broad discipline than what's being represented in these images. You would get the impression from this that a geologist never sits inside at a desk and looks at a computer. But even that geology is a little bit better than if you Google a scientist, which is an even more broad term, but the pictures you get back are even more uniform, even just in the colors, right? Every single picture here, everyone's in, uh, in a lab, in a white coat. They're like, um, you know, they're looking at, they've got test tubes, they're, they're looking behind a microscope. And this is such a narrow aspect of a, a scientist. A scientist is such a much broader term. Even, you know, they've at least tried to diversify the some of these sort of like crazy white haired mad scientists. At least we've got a few more sort of um, diversity of, of people, if some more women in these pictures, but the actual image of a scientist is so narrow in these pictures that come back, which I find really um, interesting and kind of um, depressing in a way, and, and kind of a something that we're thinking about at the moment, trying to change these preconceptions, what it is that our science is about and what it is that we actually do. So to go back to this phrase, a, a seismologist down under, and the first question that an Uber driver would often always ask, why are you in Australia? Why are you not in New Zealand, for example? And the reason they're, they're saying this, the reason they sort of have this conception in their mind is actually because they know something about plate tectonics, right? So here I'm plotting um, a map, topography and bathymetry, and all the red dots are earthquakes over the last um, 50 years or so from um, something called the, the CMT catalog. So they're sort of moderate to large earthquakes. And we see that the Earth's surface, there's not a uniform distribution. We see that earthquakes are concentrated in primarily linear chains or linear belts um, of earthquakes. Um, we know that these regions, these earthquake um, chains or belts define um, the plate boundaries. Places like New Zealand lie on top of a plate boundary, so they have lots of earthquakes. But countries or continents like Australia that lie in the middle of a plate experience relatively few earthquakes. So to the average person or to my Uber driver, it's really confusing as to why a seismologist, you know, why you would want to, if you're a seismologist, why would you want to come and work in Australia? Well, the first kind of misconception is just because we're in the middle of a, a plate and um, we don't have any, you know, we don't have a plate boundary running along our coast, we do still get earthquakes. So on average, Australia experiences around 100 magnitude three um, earthquakes. And this is a map um, including lower magnitude earthquakes and you can kind of see the distribution across Australia. And again, that distribution isn't uniform um, coverage across the continent, it is still concentrated in certain zones or certain parts um, of the continent. Um, for example, along the, the Flinders Ranges in South Australia or Southwest um, WA or Southeast Australia, uh, where I am currently um, in Canberra, tend to have more earthquakes than other parts of um, the continent. And really that's related to the underlying geology and the underlying um, tectonic structure um, of the continent. It's these kind of, in general, it's these kind of old faults, old weaker zones that then when they're being, when the whole continent is being kind of squished and pushed by the plate boundaries that surround it, is these weaker parts that will then um, uh, rupture or move in an earthquake. So that's something that I don't think everybody realizes. It's something that since I've come here, become interested in 
And I have a student, um, Shubham Agarwal, who's doing his PhD with me. And he's actually been looking at the seismicity. He's been detecting, locating, and studying the seismicity um, around Lake Eyre in South Australia. So I have um, an array out these yellow symbols that are kind of in an inverted triangle around Lake Eyre. And we've also been collaborating um, with the Geological Survey of South Australia, um, JP O'Donnell, who's leading these white dots, the deployment of seismometers out at the same time. And we've been using these combined data sets and, and Shubham's been, um, now that we have instruments in this location, he's been able to pick up a lot more um, earthquakes. He's found 77 so far, and he's even been able to get focal mechanisms to study the, the pattern of the, um, pattern of the rupture or the fault rupture during those um, events, which have never been done for this region before. So there's lots of interesting things there and um, possibly related to the edge of the goal or craton here, we are kind of concentrating deformation along the edge of the craton. But really that's not the primary business of what I do as a seismologist. My primary work hasn't been in um, just detecting earthquakes. Um, I'm really interested in connections between the earth surface and the deep. And for Australia, I'm interested in the architecture and um, history of the Australian continent and how that's expressed deeper in the earth. So the Australian continent has a really rich, vast tectonic history. Um, the Western part of the continent is um, the, the oldest. We have some um, some of the oldest rocks on earth in the Archean craton. So that's these kind of orange briny colors here. We have the Yilgarn craton and Pilbara craton. We also have um, another craton, the Gawler craton, which is Archean to Proterozoic in South Australia. But really it's these kind of brown colors and pink colors are kind of um, the older parts of the continent. We're talking kind of billions of years. And the eastern part of the continent is then much younger, the sort of Paleozoic, where we've had subduction along the east coast and we've accreted these pieces onto the, the eastern, uh, eastern margin of Australia. So we have an older western part and a younger eastern part of the continent. My interest is really, we have this really rich geology at the surface, this crustal geology. How deep does that extend um, into the earth, into the mantle? We can see this crustal history really clearly um, in the geophysical character of the crust. So we can look at gravity, we can look at magnetics, magnetic field, um, concentrations of um, um, radioactive elements, thorium, potassium, um, uranium. And we can look at um, structure of the moho, so that's the crust mantle boundary. And all those correlate really well with the sort of geological boundaries that we've kind of mapped out from the geology at the surface or from the crust. But if you go deeper and now I start to look at images of the, the lithosphere, so that is essentially the, the tectonic plate. And here we're looking at seismic tomography. So we're looking at different horizontal kind of depth slices in the mantle. So we've got 100 kilometers, 150, 200. And the colors represent um, the speed at which seismic waves will travel through that material. So if they're green, they'll travel faster. If they're kind of brown to uh, beige-ish colors, they'll travel slower. And seismic waves will tend to travel through faster through material, which is colder, stronger, more rigid. So like the lithosphere, like the tectonic plate. So at each depth here, where you're seeing the green colors, you're seeing at that depth, you're still in the lithosphere. And where you see the, the brownish, beigeish colors, you're already into the asthenosphere, which is warmer, weaker, and seismic waves travel slower. So we see that the lithosphere extends beneath Western and Central Australia, um, several hundred kilometers deep, even deeper than 200 kilometers. But along Eastern Australia, the lithosphere is already thinner. Um, it's thinner than hundred kilometers. We think it's about 75, 70, 75 kilometers thick. So whilst we can see this sort of west-east difference between the age and the thickness of the lithosphere, you would be really hard pressed to look at these images and try to see, um, try to correlate these with the surface or crustal geology 
to actually be able to see differences in the characteristics of the lithosphere. Even though when we piece together Australia, we piece together these different blocks of crust and presumably also of lithosphere. So where I come in, one of the things I'm interested in to look at is to look at something called seismic anisotropy. And this is really um, a really powerful thing because it's one of our most um, direct observations of mantle deformation or mantle flow. So we know that the Earth's interior, the mantle is convecting, it's hot at the core, it's colder at the surface, and that sets up um, mantle convective motions. On my theme of stereotypes and misconceptions, the vast majority of textbooks, the vast majority of images you'd ever see of um, the mantle, mantle convection, show the Earth's interior as being kind of this boiling hot red um, mass. And that makes a lot of people and a lot of students think that the Earth's interior is liquid, but it's not, it's solid. And particularly the, the upper mantle um, is mostly composed of olivine, which is this green mineral. I actually have a little sample of it here. And you see how green that mineral is and it's shown in the picture. So that's actually what the color of the mantle, at least the upper mantle, is green, it's not red. And we can envision that even more. These are some pictures I took on a trip to Hawaii in 2018. Um, and I visited this famous beach, it's called like the Green Beach. And essentially the kind of sediment transport processes at the beach, the eruptions from Hawaii, they've erupted material from the mantle and the sediment transport processes have concentrated um, the olivine um, from those rocks, um, from the material that's been erupted. So essentially what you're looking at here in this beach, the sand, all these little green crystals are the olivine. And the people here out at the beach sunbathing don't realize that they're actually sunbathing on the mantle. So this is really, in terms of colors, this is really what the mantle actually looks like. Another really cool thing about olivine and very useful for me as a seismologist is that olivine crystals are highly anisotropic. So that means that the word anisotropy or anisotropic means a variation with direction. So depending on the direction that seismic waves travel through an olivine crystal, they travel faster or slower. And it can vary that velocity by 16%. So there's one particular axis called the A-axis, which is the fast axis or the fastest direction the seismic waves of the primary axes that seismic waves travel. And what's really useful about that is that when the mantle undergoes deformation and the olivine crystals as part of that mantle undergo flow, shear, deformation, under typical upper mantle conditions, the fast axes will tend to align parallel to the shear direction or parallel to the flow direction. So all these little, all the little individual crystals, when they all rotate with their fast, fast axes parallel to the flow, then when you come along with a seismic wave, you can infer the fast direction that seismic waves travel. And then you can say something about how the earth's interior is deforming, how the mantle is flowing, how that deformation has been preserved in the lithosphere. So how I do this is seismic waves become polarized in certain directions, traveling through aligned olivine. So it's exactly how, if you have polarized sunglasses, how that works. Um, essentially, when you have the olivine all aligned in a certain direction, only certain polarizations will make it through um, that alignment. What we do is look at something called shear wave splitting where we can measure the orientation of the fast direction, the orientation of the slow, the delay time between them, and then use that to say something about the pattern of mantle deformation. So this is something that I've um, been working on and I had an honors student, um, Claire Flashman, that worked with me for her honors um, in 2020. And she looked at the shear wheel splitting um, for seismic stations along something that's called the Bilby Array, so it was this linear transect through central Australia, crossing about a thousand kilometers north to south of seismic stations. And she measured the fast directions from um, this technique called shear wave splitting. And that's what you see here, these, um, these colored bars, these red bars are the average orientation of the fast direction at each station. 
And you see that from north to south, a lot of them are kind of aligned sort of east-west. And as you get up here, these are different um, geological provinces. Then they start to rotate to something a bit more sort of northwest, southeast. And what I find really fascinating is that this east-west orientation is really similar to some of these sort of huge gravity anomalies that we have in central Australia. So the fast directions, which are primarily primarily representing deformation of the mantle are really similar to what we're seeing in terms of the crustal features and the geology um, at the surface. So we interpreted the splitting pattern as showing strong resemblance to the surface geology and therefore that it most likely reflects deformation that has been frozen into the lithosphere that represents past tectonic events. So these events that formed Australia assembled the continent are kind of frozen into the deformation of that continent of the lithosphere and that that must have impacted both the crust and the lithosphere in order to preserve um, and generate this seismic anisotropy. I've also been looking at the seismic anisotropy in a slightly different way um, from looking at something called, called quasi love waves but essentially they're surface waves which are scattered by lateral gradients and seismic anisotropy. So if we imagine here, we have one material where the anisotropy is all aligned like this. We have a love wave, which is like a, a horizontally polarized surface wave. And when it comes along and encounters a boundary or a gradient in anisotropy here represented by a change in the direction, then some of that energy is converted from love wave motion into really wave motion, which is kind of this retrograde elliptical motion of the surface waves. So we can study that from the seismogram and we can detect or we can infer the point where the scattering happened, so the location of the gradient. And I've done this across Australia and Zealandia using a permanent network of seismic stations. And here all the circles are where I've plotted, where I've detected evidence of that scattering from sort of boundaries and seismic anisotropy. In yellow are about a third of the data points that fall within hundred kilometers of a known crustal geological boundary. And in sort of the cyan turquoise are another third of the data points that fall close to the ocean continent boundary. So the boundary between ocean and continent crust to the continental margins. So this is really interesting that the points that we're seeing correspond to kind of the surface geology or the sort of tectonic history. But what's really interesting is that the frequency at which I'm looking at these seismic waves, we know that the peak sensitivity for this is 100 to 200 kilometers depth in the mantle. So I'm not sensitive to the crust. The signal is very much coming from the mantle, but it's showing patterns that correspond to surface features. So we've interpreted, um, now we're looking at sort of profiles of west to east and south to north across Australia. We've interpreted these signals as representing evidence of fossil anisotropy that's frozen into the cretonic lithosphere, where the lithosphere is, is thick, it's 200 kilometers thick or more. Potentially at the ocean continent boundary, we're picking up some kind of localized diversion in the mantle flow that hasn't really been, um, has been difficult to detect before. And maybe where we have a sort of step in the um, lithospheric thickness, potentially we could also um, uh, generate um, sort of edge-driven convection or small sort of disturbances to the mantle flow where we're going from oceanic lithosphere into continental lithosphere. So those are the kind of questions I've been looking at. Um, I think we're seeing strong evidence that the Australian lithosphere holds significant fossilized anisotropy. And what's really exciting is this seems to preserve the rich and ancient tectonic history um, that we also see in surface geology. And I think that in the future, we may be able to more that we map this out, we might be able to use this as a predictive tool to constrain major tectonic boundaries at depth, particularly those that might be hidden beneath this blanket of sediments or those in particular that have deep mantle connections. So that's what I do, um, what my research really focuses all about, what as a seismologist in Australia, what I've been interested in and researching. So the last part of my talk, I'm gonna describe a bit of my journey 
how it was that I got to be here doing this as a psychologist in Australia. So how did it all begin? Well, I was born in a small town um, called Donaghadee on the east coast of Northern Ireland. And I asked my parents a while ago for a picture from when I was a child. And they find this one where I'm in a onesie with koalas on it. So maybe there was a bit of a premonition there that maybe one day um, I'd be heading, heading to Australia, heading down under. And this is where I, I lived in one of these houses. I'm looking out over the Irish Sea. And we faced um, a sort of part of the coastline that's called Coal Pit Bay. And I spent a lot of my childhood kind of out rambling over these different sort of rock outcrops. Um, along the coastline. And what's interesting is there's actually no coal whatsoever, but the rocks are really dark and it may be kind of reminded people of coal. I think they tried to um, extract some way back in the day, but find that it wasn't very good at producing any heat. Um, but what's really interesting is it's actually a type locality uh, for a particular fossil called a graptolite. And these are um, kind of little related to kind of plankton that used to live in like the sea and they're from the Silurian age about 430 million years ago and um, they represent a time the, the closure of the Iapetus ocean and um, they're from a kind of sedimentary accretionism accretionary uh, prism um, that's then being um, as that ocean closed and then sort of brought up um, to the surface so it's all the ash from the kind of um, volcanoes that makes the rocks really dark and I think, although, you know, I didn't study these fossils or really think too much about them, I think living in this environment and really having a kind of concept of geological time and how the Earth's surface kind of had a bit of a, a bit of an impact. Um, so I was really interested in um, the Earth, um, understanding the world around me, how um, the surroundings that I was in, how they've been formed um, over time. And I was studying my A-levels, geography, maths and physics. And I combined those into, I want to do a degree in geophysics. So I moved to London to the Big Smoke, um, to Imperial College to do a MSci degree in geophysics. Oh, come forward. And at the time, actually, um, and still today, um, in Northern Ireland, you can't, there's two main universities, and neither of them offer a degree in earth sciences. You used to be able to do geology at one of them, but then they closed that down. Um, sometime before I was choosing universities. Um, so you had to, like many young Irish people, move away to go, um, uh, many young people move away um, for work or to university. I moved to London, but I was quite happy about that. I wanted to kind of go out, explore different things, explore different parts of the world. Um, yeah, so I studied at the Royal School of Mines, the RSM um, in South Kensington in London. And I did a degree in geophysics. And you know, in the sort of whole earth science cohort, there was about a third female, two thirds um, male. And that was kind of like roughly what Imperial was. Um, Imperial College is a um, sort of science technology um, uni focused university. So it was kind of more male dominated than perhaps other universities. Um, but I was really fortunate that I had you know, I didn't kind of think about it at that time. And I had a lot of really um, inspiring female lecturers um, and particularly in geophysics. So this is a picture of um, someone took um, during a lecture. And in the background is actually Joe Morgan, who was one of my um, applied geophysics lecturers. And I was lucky in my um, fourth year, my MSI project um, that I worked with another professor, Saskia Goes, and I studied um, patterns using seismic observations looking at trying to constrain the patterns of um, formation of the oceanic lithosphere and oceanic um, cooling. But a real turning point for me and actually being interested in seismology and becoming the kind of seismologist that I am today is when I did a year abroad um, at Berkeley in California in the Bay Area and that was in my third year of undergrad. And I lived um, in a place called international house with all these people sort of all these visiting students from around the world and that's that's this building here in this picture and we were right next door um, to the stadium 
which is where they used to play all the, the football games, which is one of the pictures here. And this stadium is quite famous because the Hayward Fault, which is one branch of the San Andreas Fault system, um, goes right through the stadium. And you can actually go up the steps and see where the stadium's being like displaced um, from the kind of creep along that fault. So I lived right next to it um, and it was really, I was taking classes and kind of understanding more about this, um, what it was to kind of live near a plate boundary. But what really sort of like made a difference was during that year abroad, um, I, did a, I did a research project and I worked with um, Richard Allen, a seismologist in the Berkeley Seismological Lab. And that's when I started looking at seismic anisotropy and shear wave splitting. And I worked on um, the Pacific Northwest. So all these dark black measurements here in this map of the shear wave splitting are ones that I did. And I was looking at and studying the pattern of mantle flow um, beneath the Juan de Fuca plate as it's subducting um, beneath Cascadia. And this is a really great, it was a really great project, um, but also Richard was really supportive and um, arranged for me to get a desk in the office with other PhD students. And I really kind of got to be immersed in that kind of PhD research environment. Um, and I really felt that I kind of find my people and find what I was interested in and what I wanted to do. I find, find where I belonged to say. So after that, I was really interested in going back to the US um, to do a PhD and started looking around um, for other people that worked on um, similar topics to kind of broaden my horizons and, and try somewhere else um, and sort of experience some new things. So I settled on going um, to Yale, moving to the East Coast this time. And I worked with my PhD advisor with Maureen Long in this picture. And the reason I put this picture is shortly before I joined in 2010, um, the department at Yale hired, um, I guess had, had money to hire a bunch of new assistant professors. And these are um, all the group of assistant professors that they, they hired in the year or so before I got there. And this really, um, you see, really changed the overall demographics of the department. Um, it really meant that people like myself, who are like prospective students going onto the web pages and seeing who's at in this department, in this group, you know, you could kind of start to see people who looked like you, start to kind of imagine yourself being there. And I think that's really important to then increase then the diversity of other staff, other students that then came to work there, because like me, they could go on the website and they could really see people that look like them. So I think it's important not just to have one hire or two hires, but having this kind of critical mass um, of people really makes um, a big difference. So in terms of the PhD um, topic, I was doing my PhD studying um, subduction beneath Peru and South America. And in this region, um, it's actually one of the largest regions of flat slab subduction. So as the plate comes in, it actually subducts at about 100 kilometers depth horizontally and then sinks back down um, into the mantle. And I was looking at the seismic anisotropy and the mantle flow um, in this subduction system. I had a lot of really great experiences um, going on field work in South America, um, deploying, servicing, and retrieving um, these seismometers. So this project was this really big project putting out 40 seismometers in, in South America. Um, my PhD advisor, Maureen, was one of the PIs on this project, um, but there was two other people uh, Lara Wagner and Susan Beck at different institutions who were the other um, lead or the other chief investigators, as we'd say here on this, it was an NSF project. So it means it was a project led um, by three women. And at the time I really didn't, this didn't even like kind of enter my brain that, that this was led by three women. It just kind of, I just kind of accepted it for what it was. And it's only kind of afterwards looking back on it that I realized actually how unusual that is. I actually would like struggle to give you another example where that's the case of having a large project or a large proposal like that, where you have three female seismologists um, leading it. 
I could give you lots of examples where there's, um, you know, it's a project team that's entirely led by men. So I think this had, without me kind of realizing it, I think this had a big impression on me that really, as I was going through my PhD, thinking, well, you know, there's really no limits here. You know, as a, as a woman in science, you can really do anything. But at the same time, this kind of other stuff that would kind of start to permeate, you'd start to hear kind of like, little comments kind, kind of being made, certain things that would kind of occur. And um, particularly during my PhD, my supervisor had, um, she had two children during that time and kind of some reactions, particularly the first, the first child that she had, she was actually the first um, female faculty member in the department um, to go on maternity leave. And yes, it's the US and they have a different kind of, um, kind of approach to that but initially the kind of the university didn't know what to do and they weren't really they weren't going to give her any sort of additional time off other than you know kind of the same as if you'd gone into hospital and had an operation and it was a whole fight to kind of get that additional time and it really started to started to sort of realize a few more of these things these kind of um sort of things that would come up that weren't you kind of would take for granted but realize that they weren't actually part of the everyday system. And another good example of it is when I started in the whole department, there was only one female toilet, even though the department students was kind of like 50-50. And this actually got raised. And actually during the time that I was there, um, they actually set aside money and actually redid the female bathrooms so that we didn't have to queue up to use them, that we actually had a reasonable number of female bathrooms. Um, I'll just point out as well, another really fantastic thing during my PhD was um, I did a kind of a minor project or a side project um, with another female academic, Carolina Lithgow Bertoloni um, in London. And she was really great at having someone who was outside my PhD institution. Um, and she was really supportive. Um, she gave me lots of, um, you know, talked really honestly in conversations, gave me a lot of um, support and encouragement when I needed it. And it was really helpful having someone who wasn't in my institution, who was kind of a bit outside of it. So after that, um, I moved to a postdoc fellowship at Southampton in England at the National Oceanography Centre. And I switched um, from subduction zones to then looking at seismic anisotropy beneath mid-ocean ridges and oceanic transform faults. Um, and that was a great experience, but I started to become a bit more independent and a bit more, uh, a bit more kind of, um, you know, you were kind of by yourself and a bit more independence and a bit more kind of isolating in that time. But it was during that postdoc that I started applying for um, permanent positions or tenure track positions. And I thought it's kind of useful for other people who may be doing that now or in the future to kind of see from my personal um, statistics on it, a kind of CV of failures, if you will. Um, so to put it in perspective, I applied for, put in about a dozen different applications. Um, about a third of those four, I actually um, was invited for interview. Um, I was lucky to get two offers and then I chose to come to ANU. So I was kind of biased, I was applying for mostly positions in the US where I'd done my PhD, but also a large chunk in the UK where I currently was. And then ANU was the only one that I applied for in Australia, which is where I ended up coming. At the same time, it was really confronting going out and um, visiting these places and doing these interviews because up until then, I kind of realized that I'd actually worked with a lot of really impressive um, female seismologists or geophysicists and I kind of took that a bit for granted. And when I started visiting these other institutions, I realized that these people weren't everywhere, that a lot of the institutions were very, very male dominated. And it was quite um, confronting in lots of ways. And I started, you know, as on the job search and talking to people, um, I started to get certain comments um, from colleagues, other people that kind of you know, describing, you know, I'm going to go interview at X. And they'd say, oh, you know, they don't have very many women at, at this institution you know they really need more women to go on like 
field trips and sit on committees, you know, you might have a chance at that institution. And, um, you know, the kind of implication being that, oh, you'll get that position because they need a woman, not because I'd be, um, you know, the right fit for that institution, which is what it really was about. Um, so I didn't find that <laughs> particularly helpful at the time. I joined RSES in 2016 um, as a level B or research fellow, but it was a continuing permanent position. Um, and then I was promoted in, uh, at the start of last year um, to level C. So I went back and had a look at kind of demographics of the department from when I joined to now, and things have, have changed, sort of changed and not changed. Um, so I used the annual reports to look at the list of staff and I plotted the different levels in blue is the number of male staff, and this is academic staff, and in orange is the number of female staff. And uh, I've just gone down to level B. So when I joined, I was here, and I was the only, in the level B part, I was the only continuing uh, member of staff. And so that was kind of interesting. You come in, the vast majority of the staff are level D, level E, much more senior. Um, and I'm very much the kind of the junior member of faculty and I'm, and I'm female. If we look at, um, this is the most recent annual report from 2021. Um, a lot of people have been promoted to professor, um, which is great. And we now have, we went from zero to having six female professors, which is awesome. Um, I'm now down here though, and we have not that many people in these kind of um the sort of more junior levels we still have um quite a few women in level b but there's kind of at least that i i may be mistaken but i don't think anyone in the level b is um continuing so even after five six years i'm still kind of the junior person in the in the faculty and i find that as a female member of staff people have been really supportive um really encouraging of um my career and my career um, progress. Um, but I think it's kind of easier for people to kind of um, to do that because I'm because I'm junior and kind of seen as kind of, I guess, non threatening um, in a way. But at the same time, you start to kind of pick up and kind of comments of kind of like how people kind of describe more senior um, women in, in science. And I like this um, quote here is kind of these certain comments you start to hear kind of a bit like the Uber driver and are you a student? You start to hear them kind of being said, kind of, I don't think people realize what they're saying, but kind of, you know, that woman or kind of calling someone, you know, crazy or that difficult woman. And you start, to, when you start hearing it more and more, at first you think, oh, it's that, you start to internalize it and think, oh, you know, it's that person. But when you start hearing it more and more, you think there's something kind of going on here, like, um not everyone can kind of be like this and i think it relates to this as people become more senior and start having positions of authority actually kind of speaking up speaking back saying no dis disagreeing you start to have more backlash um, for women so this is something i don't know how familiar the term stereotype backlash is this is something that i first heard when i was at yale and i heard um, this professor Victoria Breskel speak um, at a women in science event. Um, she was a professor at the Yale School of Management. And this is one of her research topics is in this stereotype backlash. And I looked up uh, a write up of her research and some quotes about what this, how this works. So beliefs in terms of these gender stereotypes, um, you know, we kind of think of encourage men to be strong and assertive and dominant and women to be kind of warm and nurturing is the kind of the stereotype we have in our heads. And therefore both men and women risk social um, penalties when they violate these prescribed gender roles. But the kicker for, for women is, is that um, women are much more likely to have these kind of social penalties um, when they show dominant behaviors, essentially, in leadership roles or assertive behaviors. So things like asking for a raise or even a simple thing as talking in a meeting or talking too much in a meeting can carry substantial professional risk um, for women. 
And you might say, okay, well then who cares? Who cares if we're liked? We just have to accept that people won't like it. Well, the problem is that past research established that employees, um, particularly women, you have to be seen not just as successful, but also as likable in order to be seen as someone worthy of hiring or being promoted. Um, being competent alone um, is not always sufficient. So this kind of is where I'm kind of going to end, where I kind of, the things that I'm kind of thinking about at the moment is, um, you know, I've kind of shared my story, how I've navigated the system as a, a woman in science in a male dominated environment. But I haven't really talked about ways in which to change the system. And I think to change the system, you've got to stand up, speak out, um, rock the boat, so to speak. But at the same time, we know that in doing that, you're going to experience backlash. And perhaps that will then um, result in personal um, sacrifice and success. So how do we, how do we kind of thinking in, in the future, how do we be successful, but then also help other people be successful, not just in following the same system, but in how do we also change that system so that more people can be successful or a greater diversity of people can be successful. Um, so that's it. Um, and there, I'd be happy to um, have a discussion or take any questions if anyone has any.